it's very risky. Well, yes, there are risks, and responsible surgeons will discuss these risks with you. But the risks are fairly low. And we have a lot of experience with the whole process, and we are good at reducing those risks. We will tell you about the risks that we think are pertinent before surgery, particularly if there are risks that we think are specially for you. So if you have special circumstances or if you have special conditions, we will tell you what those risks are. Won't last very long. Well, 15 to 25 years is how long it should last. And if you think about that, 15 to 25 years of pain-free function, no maintenance, no need for tune-ups, pretty good. In fact, when you look at this type of procedure and you work out how much benefit it has been to an individual, it is the most effective operation that we do of any procedure. And this includes all comers. We have to look for the right one for you, as I mentioned. We have to put it in properly. We have to rehabilitate you, and we have to follow you up. Now, just one, one point I've made already, which I'll make again, is that you have to be careful about selecting a prosthesis that is reliable. And you'll see things on this day tonight and the current affair about so-and-so's had a new prosthesis that's just been on the market. That's not for you. I wouldn't have that put in because it's not likely that that's been followed up by 50,000 patients and its problems elucidated. So you want to be careful about fads. Fads are not really appropriate. You need to go for something that's going to work, that's going to go well for you, which is a low complication rate and which is likely to be still in you and working beautifully in 15 to 20 years. I'm too young. Well, there is a bit of mis there's misapprehension about this point in particular. And people say, look, you can't have a joint replacement until you're 60. If there are no other alternative treatments, and you're a 48-year-old lady who has severe arthritis in both knees, who can't get to the shops, who can't function and play with her children, I would put it to you that she's immediately ready to have joint replacement. We're going to buy her 15 years of high-quality life, and if the joint replacements need to be revised afterwards, we'll go ahead and do that too. But we are obviously keen to put, a, put back your prosthesis if possible, but if your quality of life is very poor, then it clearly makes sense to not have age as the final arbiter of your decision. Your biological age is clearly <coughs> an important consideration too, because there are people in the audience who are in their 80s, who function like people in their 60s. And as time progresses, this is increasingly an issue. We used to think that men in their early 70s were really quite old, but that's not the case anymore. And you're likely to have another 15 years of life expectancy or more. My grandmother's 98. She's got absolutely nothing wrong with her. She's probably not going to require a joint replacement, but if I'd said to her at 75 that she wasn't a candidate for joint replacement, you have 23 years of painful existence. So you mustn't think that the age in itself is the most important thing. I'm too old, this is rarely the case. But we weigh this up together and we will take account of all of the risks for you. People always say, well, am I going to go off at the airport? <laughs> and you might, does it matter? No. Can we write you a note? Yes. Will it make any difference? No. So how are we going so far? I'm probably taking a bit long, but we've talked about this team business. We've talked about the myths and the fears that go with this surgery. We've talked about preparation and recovery, and I'll be uh, succeeded in this regard by the physiotherapists and by my other group. We've talked a little bit about the operation itself, and we might talk more about that now. And we're going to talk a little bit about uh, recent advances and the future. This is a completely nothing to do with this talk, but I couldn't help putting it in. This is a little boy that we did recently from Thailand who had polio. You might have seen him in the paper. But this little boy um, basically walked on his toes since he was about eight, and he's now 13. So we had this uh, very uh, rewarding experience of doing three procedures to straighten his feet out. It's really quite a special thing being a surgeon sometimes. But uh, anyway, we've basically fixed him up and he's gone home. Nothing to do with this talk, but I couldn't help it. Now, preparation. I think this probably matters as much as anything else. The concept of you being deconditioned 
is very real. And I would say there is a small group of patients who come into joint replacement at optimum function. So we can, with the help of the physios, make a big difference to your function. We would expect that if you are conditioned well before the surgery, that you do better afterwards. And the figures show this, and the patients will tell you as well. So we would, uh, we'll talk about this just, uh, in, a, in a little while, but this is an important concept. Yeah. Upper limb strength is something that you might not have thought about. But women in particular lose substantial muscle strength into their 60s and 70s. And you would benefit substantially from seeing a physiotherapist prior to your surgery. Walking aids, we would discuss with you with the physio. And once again, Ed will cover this. What about the operation itself? Well, once again, this is a team concept. I clearly choreograph the team, but everybody works together to ensure a good outcome. We have very strict procedures within the operating room. We keep the room closed during the procedure itself. We give you antibiotic medications. You're probably not going to remember anything about this because the medications given to you by the anaesthetist will make you sleepy. And even if you can converse with me on the day, and you will, you won't remember me. Quite a good thing. Antibiotics are given. And I always use a computer now to navigate knees, and I'll show you why. That's my back. And on the right hand side there, you can see a monitor, which is in fact a computer. And what the computer does is it helps me make decisions about where to put the prosthesis. Why do I use this? And some surgeons are, in my opinion, very arrogant about this and say, well, I can put this in perfectly well and I don't need a computer. In Germany, unless you document the way you put in these prostheses, you don't get paid. So everybody uses the computers because it's been convincingly shown that the computer can make a difference to the way that the joints are put in. It's better than me. The alignment of the joint replacement matters. That is that it's straight, that it's in the right orientation and that its rotational orientation is correct. It's also good to know that it's in the right spot before you finish. So we don't have any surprises afterwards. And we think there's less pain. In fact, I'm sure there's less pain. And we're sure also that there's less blood loss. That's the uh, semi-eclipse of the moon, which happened last year, which I was up for at 3 a.m. It's fantastic. We don't only believe that the computer gives you a better recovery, but we hope also that in the long term, there's less likely to come back. So I don't really want to have to come back and ever do another operation on you. And that is the goal, I think, of joint replacement. Less reason for me to come back and revise procedures that are less than perfect, which is still minor anyway. And most surgeons will say to you, well, I don't have many revisions to do anyway. But in 10 years, they probably will. Minimises my errors. And it's fun too, and I like doing it. But it's not for everybody. And uh, as you probably know yourselves, computer literacy is not a given in our society. But we've made great steps in this, and I've been overseas to a few places and learned how to do this. It's very good. It also produces a degree of humility in the surgeon. It might sound like an oxymoron, but it, it produces a degree of humility which is very gratifying. And, and Helen and I were doing one yesterday. And we put on the jigs and we made the first cut. And I said to her, well, that looks pretty good. And she said, yeah, that looks great. So we put the computer on two degrees out in one orientation and three degrees in another. So we just recut it. It was perfect the next time, of course. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, uh, you know, otherwise I don't know about that. So how are we going so far? Well, I'm probably taking too long. But we've talked about the team. We've talked about myths and fears. Preparation and recovery, <coughs> which will be covered by other people in greater length. Operation itself, and I deliberately haven't said too much about this because the details of this are very intricate and do you really care? You really just want to put in properly by a high quality surgeon. Recent advances we'll now talk about and the future. <coughs>